the shooting range. Hi, this is Andrew again. We're still waiting for Bruce to feel good enough to get back to the microphone with each day bringing him closer to a full recovery. Wish him strength. Meanwhile, in this episode, Pages of History, The Desert Chariot, Tactics and Strategy, Laying Smoke, and Metal Beasts, The Israeli Winged Cub. Today, we're going to continue our introduction of the main characters in the recent Winged Lions update. Please welcome the top multi-role fighter from the Israel tech tree with the symbolic name of Kfir, which means a lion cub in Hebrew. You can spot some similarities with its predecessor, the French Mirage, but it's still easy to tell them apart since the Kfir has canards and an additional air intake at the base of its tail fin. Now, the highlight of this Israeli fighter is an extremely powerful turbojet engine with an afterburner. Its fuel is stored in self-sealing tanks in the wing and the fuselage. The nose hides the radar system, and above the air intakes we see 30mm autocannons with an ammo pool of 250 rounds. Its hardpoints can carry bombs and rockets of various calibers, gun pods, and air-to-air guided missiles. The Kafir is similar to the Mirage planes in its usage. It's just as light and maneuverable, but its engine is similar to the American Phantom. How big of a boost is that? Well, let's see. Near the ground, the Lion Cub can outspeed the Mirage 3 hands down. And when you reach 1,460 kilometers an hour, the engine can push further and simply destroy the wing. If you climb to around 11 kilometers, the Kfir can break 2,450 kilometers an hour, which makes it the fastest aircraft in the game. In a battle, this means that you can regain your speed after most turns, getting a much higher survivability rate, which is crucial for this plane since it only has 32 countermeasures. If you expect to fight enemy air, take a look at this set, including four AIM-9G air-to-air missiles. They're a great addition to your cannons. If the 30 millimeters isn't enough, you can drop two missiles in favor of two gun pods with Vulcans. Keep in mind, they significantly reduce your speed and maneuverability. The Kafir can surprise you with how wide its choice of suspended armament is. Would you look at that? Two air-to-air missiles can be coupled with nine 1,000-pound bombs or 10 750-pound ones or 16 500-pound ones. Every available surface under the wing can be occupied, except for the landing gear. Is it really a relative of the Mirage? Moreover, the bombs can be dropped one by one, and the ballistic computer will help you calculate the point of impact. The only thing it lacks is guided weaponry against enemy SAMs, which means that you'll have to wait till your allies handle them before employing the Cub's full ground attack potential. Tanks used to have a lot of variety. They had multiple turrets, various transmission placements, guns, and even rockets. The engineers would get quite creative back in the day. But after some time and a lot of experimentation, they found optimal solutions for many systems and got rid of the outdated ones. That's why we all imagine a tank the same way now. A turret in the middle, an engine in the rear, thick front armor, and good mobility. The T-72, Abrams, Leopard 2, Type 90, they share a lot of similarities, despite some unique features. The only tank that stands out nowadays is probably the Merkava. The first tank of original Israeli development turned out pretty unusual with its engine in the front, its hull pretty wide, its turret slim, and with an old-school spring suspension to boot. Why did it happen? In short, the Merkava was created by inexperienced engineers advised by experienced military. Israel never developed their own armor before, but their tankers had a lot of experience in driving foreign vehicles and knew perfectly well what their needs were. They placed the survivability of the crew above all. But how do you achieve that if statistics show that most tanks get destroyed by mines and heat rounds? A simple trick with making the armor thicker won't help, and it'd make the tank too heavy. The Soviet Union chose to add composite armor, but Israel didn't have the technology for it. Well, they came up with a frontal placement for the engine and the transmission. 
It was supposed to bear the brunt of a hit and save the crew even if the hull was breached. By the way, the Swedish STRV-103 was created with a similar idea in mind. There were other issues, though. Fires and ammo wreck explosions. To make the Merkava safer, the engineers placed the fuel tanks in the rear and covered the ammo racks in non-flammable casings. The latter idea was inspired by the British designs. Moreover, they dropped the hydraulic turret drive in favor of the electric one since spilled oil is quick to catch fire. Finally, let's talk about the turret. While the hull of the tank is often hidden behind the landscape, the turret is visible at almost all times, and that's why it gets hit most often. Therefore, the engineers tried their best at giving it a smooth shape with a minimal size. All of these efforts made the Merkava rather controversial. It took a lot of creativity to increase the survivability of the tankers, but early modifications still had inferior armor. The bulky hull also made the whole tank heavy, as much as 60 tons in the earliest version and even more in later upgrades. With an engine power limited to 900 horsepower, they could only dream of good mobility. Well, at least Israel isn't a huge country, so no one expects rapid relocations to someplace a thousand miles away. The local environment is also the reason for the spring suspension, by the way. It can survive much longer than the torsion type on rocky ground. Could some other MBT replace the Merkava? Most likely, but it's not that important, really. The Israeli engineers took on an extremely difficult task with no experience and managed to come up with a few non-standard solutions and build a tank famous worldwide. The Merkava is unlikely to find a huge customer base abroad, but Israel still has something to be proud of. There's a lot of situations in battles when you need to quickly hide from your enemy. And that's why most tanks have at least one type of smoke system. What types are out there? How do you use them? That's what we're going to talk about today. We'll start with the smoke canisters placed in the tank's rear. They're widespread among German Rank 1 tanks and Soviet post-war era machines. Their main advantage is an almost instant release of a smoke screen. But the problem is it's deployed behind the tank, which means you'll have to reverse to hide yourself. Still, it's pretty useful for small repairs or a retreat since this kind of screen lasts 30 seconds. The next type is special shells that explode on impact and create a smoke screen where you shoot them. They're useful both for hiding your own machine and to cover a line of possible enemy fire, like when you need to cross an open area, or for your allies, of course. The dispersion time and the size of these smoke screens depends on the shell's caliber. For instance, the Panzer IV's 75mm shell only leaves a small cloud that lasts 30 seconds, while the Japanese Type 75 can hide a whole street for 40 seconds. Next, we have early smoke grenade launchers. They're usually found on the turret and shot in a series to lay the screen in front. Some machines have these launchers inside the combat compartment and their grenades are shot one by one, which means you can use them sparingly. These smoke screens only last for 30 seconds too, but they have a serious flaw, a five second delay before the grenade touches the ground. Modern solutions solved this issue, so let's talk about them. All top MBTs have aerosol smoke grenades. They're triggered mid-air, no ground touch required, which reduces smoke laying time by half. The size of the screen is also bigger, but the dispersion time is shorter, 24 seconds. On the other hand, modern smoke screens have a special formula that make them obscure to infrared light, a quality crucial to top rank battles. Finally, there's the last type, the exhaust smoke system, or the ESS. It works by adding a small amount of fuel to the exhaust system of the tank. The fuel evaporates and creates the screen that you can lay for a few dozen meters if you're going fast enough. Unfortunately, it only lasts about 10 seconds and it won't save you from thermal vision devices. On the plus side, you can use the latter to your own advantage. Turn on the ESS, roll back, and hit the unaware enemies using your thermals. Of course, it only works until you stumble upon an enemy who doesn't forget to use thermals themselves. You should also remember that the ESS won't work if your engine is damaged. Well, that's it for the smokes. Use them wisely and they'll help you get out of trouble more than once. Now it's time we answered some of the questions you asked us in the comments.
The first question was sent by a player called B. Septian Surya Saputra. Why do the Lorraine 40T and M56 Scorpion use tires with rubber track instead of conventional steel tracks? Hi there. The rubber tracks are usually found on the road wheels of fast vehicles. It dampens the shock of impact on the track when moving cross country. Paul Berchi writes, how can I play with helicopters in custom battles? Hi, Paul. We've reconsidered some custom battle settings recently, so helicopter pads and other objects in high rank battles depend on the maximum allowed battle rating. Another question comes from Raditya Kunkurojati. Why are the British Jaguar air-to-air -air missiles on the top wing? Hello there. It offers a whole range of benefits. For instance, putting missiles over the wing frees up more space for bombs underneath it. Sometimes the overwing pylons were used for additional fuel tanks. The fuel would flow down to the aircraft naturally, which saved the need for pumps. Nevertheless, this design does have a major flaw that prevented it from being widespread. Installing something over the wing is a huge pain for ground service personnel. Farbod Gorbani asks, are German planes good? Hi, Farbod. Well, planes of all nations are good in their own way, the German ones included. By the way, we've made some videos called Climbing in the Ranks, where we talk about notable machines. There's one about German aircraft too, so check it out. And the last comment for today was written by Crapstar. Are there slipstreams with armored vehicles like in car races in order to get faster? Hi there. Most armored vehicles move so slow that the effect is almost impossible to notice. So unfortunately, there's no way you can outspeed your ally on the way to the point due to a slipstream. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to lay some smokes before you retreat. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.